Hello, everyone. Welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager, and I get to be your host today. We want to thank our sponsor, Vacation with an Artist. They're new with us today, and they have an interesting program where you do an internship, basically, uh, with an artist in um, anywhere in the world. It could be an artist in Japan, in Mexico, Wherever the artist is, you go there and you spend four or five days a week, whatever, as their student. It's a great concept and they uh, have a wonderful program. Go check them out sometime. Um, today, our artist is Rihanna Griego. We are excited to have her here. She's a <clears throat> textile artist based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She has found harmonic resonance in the philosophies of Sayori Zen weaving. And she's gonna talk some more about that. A tradition she studied and has practiced for the last 10 years. In its free form, the wabi-sabi nature has moved her to create dimensional landscapes, embrace the beauty of imperfection with her textiles. And she's moved by the spirit of the land and the deserts of the American Southwest. From her lineage it hails her Mexican, the Tana Autumn and the Spanish heritage provides artistic portals through which she commutes with her ancestors to bring forth the legacy of textiles as timeless objects of art. From the language of plants <clears throat> as medicine to dyeing materials, Rihanna's reverence for the relationship between humans and land, sky, birth, <clears throat> the foundations to bring more beauty into the world through her art. And we are excited to have her here today. Hey, Rihanna. Hello, Skogdash, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, let's start with our first question is, what is your favorite tea? <laughs> Vanilla latte right here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I love the lattes. Those oh, are my, my favorites goodness. too. It's fuel, fuel for just creativity. Yes, it is. It is. Um, <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about how you got started in fiber? Sure. So uh, I've moved around a lot and I was living in Oakland at the time. And uh, the way that this, I mean, the, the pure magic of this opportunity to learn how to weave just came about so simply one day. So I was on Lake Merritt having a conversation with a friend in Oakland. And I said, you know, I think I'm ready to learn how to weave. And uh, this friend of mine ran a vintage boutique and she said, that's so funny because I just took a class with a weaver yesterday. And I said, oh, cool. Can I have her contact information? Contacted Lynn Harris, uh, who is my second mentor. I had an initial sculptor mentor many years back. Took a class with her and the rest was history. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. were you around weaving as you were growing up? No, not at all. Oh. Um, on my mother's side of the <clears throat> family, let me see if I can get this right. So my great grandmother and my grandmother were both knitters and crocheters, but it wasn't something that was, you know, really prevalent in the space. It was like, here are the blankets, you know, that grandma would make and here are some of the doilies. Um, and so, you know, I've really been trying to understand where that first contact, right? That, that inspiration happened. And I, I can't quite pinpoint it, mm -hmm. but What's so beautiful about, you know, the natural unfolding, I think whenever we have that intuitive hit with art or any type of career degree, something that really brings a lot of passion, um, I feel like you're intended to do that very much the way that I was with weaving. And the year mm -hmm. after I began weaving, I ended up finding out that my ancestors here, this is all, you know, mm -hmm. unknown to me. Um, I've had weavers in my bloodline for generations. Well, you started out using the Sayori weaving system. Mm -hmm. uh, so talk some about what Sayori is for people who may not know what it is. 
And then talk some about what attracted you to that type, type of weaving. Absolutely. So <laughs> story was started in the 1960s by Miso Jo. She was, uh, and I use parentheses, air quotes often because she was a traditional weaver. And one day she happened to be in the studio and broke one of the threads while she was weaving an obi. And something about that process had just sparked this new sense of curiosity and awe and beauty with that imperfection. So this lineage, you know, came about. And so it originated in Japan, but it has spread all around the world. There are, I'm trying to think about, um, I mean, there are so many Saori weavers here in the States. But what drew me to it was number one, you know, the ease of being able to sit down and play without rules, regulations, just jump in because textiles are so mystifying. You know, if you don't know how to weave, crochet, I mean, the plethora of things that we can do with textiles, it can feel a little intimidating. Mm -hmm. And one of the most beautiful things about Lynn was just here, sit down. The warp has already been threaded for you. Here is the yarn, begin to play. And it was just that that moment of touching the fibers. I feel like I was just connecting with something so deep and profound within myself. And I'm not a mathematical person. I mean, bless all the hearts of weavers who love to count and, you know, love that order. My brain does not work that way because we also don't see that level, I guess, of perfection by human standards in nature. Mm -hmm. I think there is so much reflection given back to us in that dialogue of finding beauty in things that are broken and leaves that are decaying. So um, one of the principles with Saori is that there are no mistakes. And I've really been able to expound upon that philosophy, not just in the textiles, but really to embody that in my life and something else they you know teach you is that the loom is here to guide you rather than having this preset idea you know you are in communion with the loom it is teaching me it is guiding me so every wabi-sabi you know salvage fringe breaking of a warp thread it's all intended to be there mm -hmm. and and I just fell in love with that. So talk some about Wabi Sabi. A lot of people don't know what that is. Okay. So the concept, you know, this is a, um, I'm going to try and simplify it, but it's about looking at the world without the lens of perfection. It is really finding awe in things that are distorted or things that are broken, things that have character. You know, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with like Raku um, pottery, you know, but the mending of putting ceramics back with gold fill and really appreciating every little crack in there. That, I mean, I guess that's as close as I'm, you know, going to be able to explain it, but there is so much of this embracing of life as we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Maybe you all are, but you know, it, it's just such an inviting process to give yourself, to give permission to play. And that to me, if I could coin anything with Sori, it is really about experimentation, play, mm -hmm. let loose. Well, the, we're going to look at one, a couple of your pieces right here. These two and I call them shawls. I'm not sure what the, or wraps. I'm not sure what your terminology is for those were. I just was struck by how bold they are and strong. Um, and, and the contrast are so balanced. So would you talk about the inspiration for these works? Absolutely. So I think in saying all of that, you know, as a creative, it's also really important to have those challenges you know, where we sit down and we have an idea and we're trying to figure out how to execute that. So um, 
those pieces specifically, those are my drape capes. They are inspired by Southwest jewelry. Oh. And uh, the design on the front one, I, I refer to as a thokog, which is a, a mountain design as, as someone who's indigenous at the Honotham. And so, you know, there is a story about the perspective of climbing up to mountains. And I remember hearing this story, you know, during winter time and feeling so <laughs> deeply impacted by that, that I really like to honor that design. And I really like to think about bringing in the perspective of that mountain and holding that level of clarity when, you know, I do choose to weave things that are a bit more symmetrical. Now, when you wove these, um, <clears throat> did you weave, weave, bleh, weave them together or did you weave one right after the other? Because they're very similar, but they're very different. So the piece uh, that I happened to be wearing, that was the second piece. And so mm -hmm. I started weaving these, uh, what year? Okay, <laughs> we're 2024. <laughs> so this is in the winter of 2023 last year. And I had been down in Arizona, you know, making making that connection with the mountain to hold that perspective. And so after I came back from Arizona, you know, in the middle of cold New Mexican winter, I decided to play with some of that. And so for anyone that, you know, is familiar with the South, Southwest, excuse me, you're going to see a lot of uh, turquoise. Mm -hmm. sterling and turquoise and so you know I did a few of those pieces and I can admit it was a little challenging because I had to count <laughs> oh <laughs> darn that math <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's just so different right because again Saori is all about free form and just let your let yourself go and dream and this was more of a practice and just stay steady, stay focused, count. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, the You describe the clothing that you create as art for the body or the person. So if I kind of expand that, are you saying that when one wears something beautiful, that person also becomes art? I would say yes. Because I think, you know, every day that we are gifted in this lifetime very much is a gift from creator. And what we choose to put on our bodies, the way that we choose to hold that level of reverence for our life, mm -hmm. the way that we choose to adorn ourselves, whatever meaningful jewelry, hat, garments, you know, it very much is an honoring of that gift. And um, I... I think I've always been that way. You know, I collected vintage for years and I also think that had an influence on textiles and really being drawn to things that were different, things that no one else was wearing, especially in high school, totally stood out. And I think that's really stuck with me in terms of being someone who designs is that you know, my collectors are looking for something different. Mm -hmm. And in returning to that idea of every day being a gift, we can choose to blend in mm -hmm. or we can choose to honor ourselves and stand out and express who we are and, and feel a lot of freedom in that. And as much as I've tried to fit in in my life, I never have. And so it's such a beautiful thing to be creating this artwork and adorning myself in it and just saying like, I feel damn good, you know, in wearing this, I made this and what a gift I get to celebrate. And, you know, art is so subjective, you know, it's also like art to me is, it's a way of life, you know, thinking artfully with your mind, it's not about being on board with what everybody else says is art. It's really about how you see the world. Oh, that's so true. I I think, well, everybody, but especially all the the, the makers that are watching today, you know, you can see all the hearts popping up. They're all saying, yeah, yeah, that's true. 
So some of these pieces that you've shown here, I was so struck by the photography. I mean, just the photograph itself could be a piece of art, um, let alone the piece that you took a photograph of. And I was just really curious, why did you put so much thought into the composition? These photographs are just amazing. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I do a lot of my own photography and composition with photography is so important. And I think when it comes to, you know, this conversation, what are my, what are my inspirations? I mean, it's earth, it is the land and the work is so inspired by what I see out in these places. So for the image, you know, I'm wearing one of my blankets. I climbed up um, way out in the Badlands there. There's just so much texture and wandering around and appreciating the different strata. You know, it's not just a very, it's not a visual thing. It's very much about layers of time mm -hmm. and the metaphor of all life, you know, that has made an imprint there. So some of the collections I do like to shoot out on nature where I am really looking at the different tones that I'm seeing everywhere. If you've been here to New Mexico, you know this place is all about the light. And so what I love to do to take certain pieces that mimic the land, you know, and just create a very artful presentation because like I said before, it's art is a way of life. You don't just do you art in the studio and close it up? It's it's really how you embody it and and live that truth. You can, uh, especially the one on the left. You could really see the, um, like the strata in the the rocks, and then the stratas in the 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 poncho or whatever that happens to be. Um, mm -hmm. It just really struck me how, mm -hmm. like you said, you're mimicking what's around you. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's also, you know, I wanted to also share that too, because as weavers, as anyone, you know, who is a weaver, um, I guess kind of dependent upon what community you come from, you know, it's about mm -hmm. storytelling. And my textiles, certain collections are really about memories. I just, I live here in New Mexico now, but I waited 12 years to move here. I just have this whole lore with this place. I wouldn't shut up about it for years. And friends were like, just move to New Mexico. <laughs> and so now that I'm here, you know, all of the artwork I'm making, it, it's just moved by the land. I have good, good memories on that place, you know, like a, a beautiful walk, a beautiful hike by myself. Life is so sim simple when you're just outside. And so I really like to take that inspiration and go to the studio and also share that with my collectors too. Well, this next piece, I, I just fell in love with it. And it's one of those things that I, I just kept going back to the image because I wasn't really sure why. I mean, I could, it's a beautiful piece, but it just really spoke to me in many ways. And I was wondering, do you get that kind of reaction? Because you talk about your collectors. Do you get that kind of reaction from people? And what is your response to them? I mean, I feel like I've met people across every board. I have met people who don't understand textiles as fine art. Absolutely. You know, having um, been doing this, it will be... 12 years in February of next year. Um, I will admit I had a lot of pushback, you know, from people placing value as textiles and specifically as fine art. And as someone who, you know, I tell everyone when I first introduce myself, I do fine art, wear wearable art and home goods. And so, you know, initially I did find it really challenging trying to sell the work because people are so used to everything being mass produced outside of the country mm. that their own relationship of fiber, having an awareness as to where those fibers come from, you know, has been so limited. Uh, and so I, I think I got lost on the question. <laughs> I was just talking about how people 
I how I reacted so strongly to mm. this piece. And I was wondering what your reaction is to people when they have a, a strong reaction to something. Whether and I loved it that you started off with both positive and negative. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine it to be similar to any other medium of art. I mean, I am so grateful to my collectors. Like I can't even begin to tell you the people that love what I do. I've made people cry before with my artwork. It's very humbling, you know, and it's also so exciting because I didn't dream this life up for myself. You know, it just kind of happened and the subtle unfolding of learning about my ancestors who are weavers, who are here in New Mexico. The whole storyline is really beautiful, very profound. And uh, it is such a gift to really see the people that make that connection with my work to the point where they want to place it in their home and they want to have that memory of that piece that brings them joy. And very much the same way with my collectors, you know, who wear my artwork. And I've really tried to, you know, identify what is what is the intention, you know, of being a weaver. And after almost 12 years, I really do feel like I've refined it, which is I'm just trying to touch the world through my unique voice. Because textiles are tactile, it's about touching, right? That's why it's mm -hmm. so hard to go in a museum and you can't touch things. It's, it's my way of contributing my energy, my love, my perspective, and doing that in a uh, tactile form to literally touch people, to cloak them, to make them feel really good in my creative offering. So when you <clears throat> put a piece in a gallery or in an exhibit, do you share with people either the story behind the piece or the meaning of the piece? When you're talking about a collector, um, is that part of what you give them? Because I know some artists, there's a whole story with them. And some artists is like, no, I want it. I want them to project completely from themselves. Where are you on that continuum? I would probably say right in the middle. Okay. You know, because again, I think we're turning to this idea, you know, there's there's so much lore, you know, people are really drawn to New Mexico, to Santa Fe. Oh, we have to go see Re in her studio and pick up a piece because they're gonna have that piece and have a memory. Right. And so part of it is that way, you know, um, or at least people making a memory through the work. I don't get to meet all my collectors, you know, when I do, especially because I run an online business and I really hope I get to meet many of them. Um, I, I guess I kind of leave it open. Mm -hmm. I think there's also, you know, I can share my inspiration, but what's so cool is also seeing how people are responding to it and having their own interpretation and, and, ideas being born because again being a weaver is not just about textiles it, there's such a strong metaphor about being a weaver in your life it's about sharing it's about weaving a beautiful web of life and so much of that is about the sharing and sharing of inspiration and so uh, i feel really grateful to in the last almost 12 years I've seen this incredible resurgence of textiles, people popping up, people telling me, I decided to go to school because I love what you do and I want to learn how to do that. Or I want to become a weaver too, because there was weaving, you know, in my ancestry. Mm -hmm. And so it really is about um, a web of inspiration and beauty. One of the other concepts that I, I saw you talk about was time. And it, it will, you, you went in great detail about it. So I just want you to talk some about that because you stated that you choose to create beauty with your time. And there's just other concepts of time that are really important to you. Can you talk some about that? Sure. Well, for all my weavers out there, you know, there is absolutely no rushing through weaving. And that I think is um, 
we only have so much time on this planet. So the way that we choose to think, the way that we choose to cultivate community, the beauty that we choose to speak and that we seek in this life, you know, is that's part of our journey. And as someone who spends <laughs> so much time in the studio weaving with each piece, I think a lot about that. It's like, I am gifting people my energy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not always about the translation of here are the hours to this is what the cost. Mm -hmm. And I think when consumers and people really begin to change the way that they relate to art or arts, you know, traditional arts that have been passed down, you're literally getting life force from someone into that piece. And, uh, you know, I do think a lot about that. It's like, I'm giving people my time. And with this time that I have on this planet, I am just so clear, this is what I'm here to do. I'm here to weave. I'm here to bring beauty. So that will ripple out and it will find someone who needs it. And maybe that inspires them to go on a new process. But, you know, it all kind of comes back to to time. What are we doing with it? Well, I thought it was an interesting talk that you did. Um, your colors range from very intense, like reds and blacks and dark browns, and then all the way over into the neutrals. And this next image, there's two ponchos and they are, they show the contrast. And um, I'm just curious, how does color play into design for you? Like, do you say, these are the colors I see right now or I want to work with, and then I'm going to design something with it? Or is it the other way around? <clears throat> it's a little bit of both. Um, the, the drape cape to the left, that was part of a 22 piece runway show I did last year during Indian market here in Santa Fe. And I had just come back from Tucson where I was um, engaging in ceremony. And the colors, you know, this is really about memory and this beautiful time being down there in the heat of summer. It was uh, really about a lot of the, or by dodge or fruit from the Suaro, you know, the the open heart nature of seeing the bythodge there on the dirt and the contrast of that red with the landscape that was just so memorable to me. So that specific collection, you know, is all red tones. Whereas the neutrals, I have to say, you know, I'm actually wearing one of my pieces today. Um, I personally, I feel stronger when I wear neutral colors. I sometimes joke like I was born in black. I love, I love wearing black. It's just so chic, especially having been in New York City years ago. Um, but there's something that is just so soothing about neutral tones, which again also is that homage to the desert or to different landscapes. But you know, I mean, color really does, it evokes a power. Like when you wear red, get ready for attention. You know, I think there really is that sense of love and that passion, you know, that is present in all of the red tones. And then I have clients who are like, no, I want to be a little more refined and subdued, but I need that texture to really, you know, make me stand out in what I'm wearing. And that's when I jump into more of the neutrals and like that beautiful tunic there that was all hand spun cotton from Oaxaca, a lot of tufts of silk, lots of, you know, natural fibers. Well, they're beautiful pieces. And um, the next I'm going to talk about the piece called Dialogue. And I think it's behind you also, right? A lot of people are asking about what is that piece behind you? And this <laughs> is an amazing piece. And I think it has a, a like a little history with it or, or a lot of meaning to it. Could you talk some about this piece? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, you know, I think some of the most engaging moments between collectors, observers, audience, 
an artist is having a moment of vulnerability. So I'm going to be a little vulner vulnerable here. But uh, back in June, you know, I was having a really difficult time. I was feeling really depressed that my life just wasn't where I wanted it to be as a single woman desiring family. And it was feeling immensely challenging for me to leave the house, leave the studio. Wow. And what's so cool and what is so powerful about art, when you were able to use it as a transport and you were able to use it as therapy, is when you commit yourself to just saying, okay, I'm in this mire. There are so many things out of my control at this moment. I'm going to take this and I'm going to extract it and I'm going to put it into artwork so I don't have to feel this at the moment. And there was this profound surrender, you know, with the piece is titled Dialogue, but it was as if during that time I was caught in this place between my mind and my heart, but I wasn't in union with mind and, and body. And so I just said, okay, I'm going to drop off the mat. And I was staying up till about 2 to 3 a.m. weaving that piece. And the moment it was done and I got it stitched up, I said, okay, I feel healed. You know, because so much of what we're thinking up here can really affect what we're perceiving out and about and the opportunity to just say, well, nothing's holding me back right now. I'm an artist. Like I have so much freedom in my life. I may not have these things yet, but I do have the opportunity, you know, to heal myself in this moment. So that's really what that piece was about. And all of the red tones, right? It's, I mean, it's striking it. It's powerful. It's visually inspired by abstract art because I love abstract art. You know, but there was so much more um, around, you know, when you're looking at a lot of like just these these forms in there, it's as if they are these memories or this chaos that I'm trying to extract and transform it into beauty. Well, it is a strong, amazing piece. And um, I'm sure we're going to have more questions about it later, but... Um, I appreciate you also sharing um, what it meant for you. That I appreciate that. That was very generous on your part. Thank you. We also do um, pieces of art, um, for lack of a better term. And this is one of them. And what struck me so much about this piece, and I guess this is from all those art classes I took in college, is the use of negative space. Um, mm -hmm. So can you talk some about designing this piece? So that piece took, I warped it last September, right at this time, out on my patio, and I couldn't quite get to it, you know, but I, um, I actually have the loom right here. It's a five by five upright loom. And so it's a different tool than what I work on when it comes to, you know, my garments or for the most part, everything else. And so I wanted to return to a place of surrender. I wanted to play. I just wanted to sit down without any expectation as to what the direction was going to be. And so I began to, you know, naturally dye some of the fibers there. Um, I always love to reference Joseph Grau Garriga, who was a Spanish textile artist who's just God, I love the dimension with his work. And I had been looking at some of his work, you know, just trying to understand how to create more dimension with what I was doing. So um, I ended up finishing that piece in January and was just grabbing things from everywhere, you know, honestly, not even thinking about it. But I love negative space. It feels like these little portals into mm -hmm. something but it also has a bit of a dialogue with where you choose to hang that, you know? And what's so beautiful about that negative space is like, I mean, I know where, you know, this piece ended up going in a beautiful home, but sometimes people, you know, hang these artworks 
in in front of a window mm. and so you get that light to come through and so you know i really do feel like my process around art is about welcoming more light you know into my being and so that's really where a lot of the negative space uh comes into play yeah while you were talking i thought now this would be interesting because if you put it on a white wall it looks one way if you put it on a beige wall or red wall or a black wall it really would different and then you talked about the light so the mm -hmm. this really will change depending on where the person puts it right yeah and you know and that's also a, a moment where the collector can personalize you know the way that they were relating to this artwork as well mm -hmm. Um, you do functional art, um, as well as art pieces. So when you start weaving, do you know ahead of time, like I, I need to make, you know, you know a, a scarf or I just need to make something, but I don't know what it's going to be. How do you start a piece? Where are you inside when you start a piece? Um, well, I can say right now, I, my head is down in my wearable art i'm building you know my fall winter collection which i've been working on for quite some time and it feels like it never ends <laughs> um but you know i would say most of the time it's really intuitive especially with the garments you mm -hmm. know if i have yardage light you know laid out and i have to figure out what goes where sometimes i put a little thought in that but again the process is to really be about just filling it out, letting the loom dictate, you know, what is going to happen over this next week, two weeks, three weeks, et cetera. Uh, with the fine art, you know, I can attest that during COVID, when I had all of that time, I worked on a seven piece series that had been in my mind for about six years. And the concept was trying to figure out how to interweave everything to mimic baskets. And so, so the traditional, you know, art form of the Honotham people is basketry, you know, pottery is included in that too, but Autham people are really known for their baskets. And so during that time in COVID, uh, I had to draw things out and everything was woven into individual strips and then interwoven together. So it took a little more planning, but I, I would probably say 80% of the time it's intuitive. I sit down, I look at my yarn wall, I put on the music, and then I just start pulling and I really go with that feeling. Oh, that's great. People love, and I do too. I love to hear how the design process is so different from everyone. So mm -hmm. that's great. That's wonderful. So what's next for you? Uh, well, when I actually finish, <laughs> when I finish this collection, <laughs> which is hopefully going to be uh, the beginning of November, okay. um, which I am just, I am so thrilled, so, so thrilled about what is transpiring right now in the studio. So uh, once that's done, I'm going to celebrate that. I will get through the holidays. Um, there is something in the works that hasn't been confirmed but if it does go through it will be my first big runway show in the spring and i'm really looking forward to that because it also includes a giant installation uh, that i weave for the models to walk through oh how exciting mm -hmm. how exciting now will information be on your website about that when it finally gets mm -hmm. confirmed and can Oh, I can't wait to see that. That's amazing. What a great concept. Yeah. yeah, you know, because again, it's like one of the most difficult things I have as a textile person is to go into a museum and really not be able to touch things. I just want to grab everything and wrap myself in it and wear it. <clears throat> and so being able to do a runway show and then have the models walk through, you know, there's a beautiful storyline and thread between that. Um, but I tell everyone, please sign up for my newsletter. You know, that is the best way to really keep keep up to date with what I have um, on the docket. Well, that's a great idea. Good idea. Yeah, um, your website email, I mean, your website address is in chat, and then we'll talk some more about that later. Um, 
So we've got some questions. Let's go to those. Um, this is the problem when we go to questions later, is that is there a pocket woven into the wrap and are they stuffed or is it real bulky yarn? I think they're referring to the two of you and then the woman behind you. There you go. I think this is what she's referring to. So she wants to know, is it like a double weave with a pocket or is it just bulky? Uh, that is a bulky yarn that I used. There, there is no, I don't do double weaving. I've tried it. Um, and there aren't any pockets. So basically with the drape capes, they're stitched in the back. You know, it's like a classic Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So okay. open in the front, open on the sides, top it over the shoulder. Well, Debbie is asking the question that kind of leads into this is what kind of yarns do you like to use? What do you find that you use most of the time? knitting yarns why is that oh they just feel so good so everything right it's like everything goes back to the way that it feels how does art feel how does this feel on your body mm -hmm. and using tiny lace fingering weight drives me nuts it is just there's certain pieces for that but it just doesn't excite me to use so I don't really use that and um, my favorite, absolute favorite to use, cones and yarns that I find at estate sales that no one else is going to have. That is like, that's, that's gold. That's gold to me. <laughs> I love that stuff. So knitting yarns, antique stuff, you know, here in New Mexico, we have uh, the Espanola Fiber Art Center. Mm -hmm. And they do, I think it's in the spring, they do their like, garage sale and a lot of weavers will come and dump all of the yarns and I just go nuts. I love it. So it sounds very instinctual. It's not like you're saying, well, I think I need a cotton for this. You just kind of look at yarn and go, that's it. That's what I need. Right? Yeah. But it's like, you know, um, it's also, I'm, I'm really sensitive to wool. Oh, okay. I, I didn't used to be. And so it's also about like, what feels good on me? So, you know, I, I know we all have different sensitivities and I keep that in mind, especially when it comes to certain weights, right? Based off of seasonal wear. But for the most part, it's like, does that feel good? Is someone yeah. going to feel really luxurious in that? Or are they going to be like itching and, you know, like polyester, you just, you can't breathe in it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Larice is asking, and we've kind of talked about this, but she says, how do you start a piece? So you have a general composition in mind, or do you start with a collection of yarns for a piece and let it evolve? So you kind of talked about that. But the other thing I wanted to know is, do you, um, do you ever find that you need to draw things out ahead of time? Sometimes. But, you know, I... Uh... I'm not, I don't do things on a graph paper and I'm not okay. counting, you know, sometimes I do sketch, but it's very rare that I sketch. I'm mm -hmm. also like the worst drawer in the world, you know, so there's a reason why I don't do it. Um, but I think it really, you know, sometimes it's like I'm out in this place and I love a lot of the colors and now I need to go and find the right yarns to mimic something like that. Um, a lot of it is also just like curiosity, you know, when I started to tap into silks, I was like, I just want to know all the different varieties and weights and how they feel and really how to play with them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can't, at least for me, I can't really draw lines of silk out. Yeah. Um, there's a couple, uh, somebody was asking about, uh, oh, this is Sue. Hey, Sue, Siri. Um, do you weave on a Seori loom or do you use a multi-shaft loom with the Seori practice? Uh, great question. I work on a Seori loom. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, it I sounds have... like you also have a tapestry loom. Do you use a tapestry loom or a frame mm -hmm. loom? Yeah. So I, I have a frame loom. I, let me see. I used to have a Leclerc many, many years ago, but then I moved and, you know, we can't really lug those around. Uh, I have been really interested in learning, you know, Rio Grande style. I know those are only uh, two harness, but I'm I'm really curious to get on a four and just see how I feel, especially when I'm standing up. Mm, okay. 
Um, someone's asking, and I'm assuming they're talking about the piece behind you, if that was tapestry. And I knew people were going to start asking about that. So is this done? You said about sewing. So was this done in sections and sewn together or, and was it done on a tapestry loom or? It was done on a uh, Sori floor loom. So okay. I tend to use the comb. Um, so I'll comb, you know, just whatever idea of feeling happens to be coming up. And I, I started with one panel. I had yarns all over the floor and just started to pick things up, got my tapestry um, comb and just started to weave that way. And once I had one panel and I said, okay, that really, that feels right. Let's expand. So it is, um, I'm going to show you. Oh, good. Thank you. So it is four panels all woven together. It's all mixed fibers. Uh -huh. And there are some holes in here, which I personally love to let be. I've done just um, some embroidery thread on here. Lots of metallics, but again, everything for the most part is like a mixed fiber when I'm doing larger pieces like that. So you would weave a strip. Um, would you cut it off and then go to the next one or weave the whole thing and then cut it up? Uh, so I would weave, so again, this is on the Saori loom. So uh -huh. I would weave a panel, cut it off, lie it down, and then continue to weave the other four, have those stitched together. And then because this artwork was mounted, it was uh, mounted onto... It's a canvas, hmm. so it's been stitched all the way so we could actually stretch it over uh, wood bars. And then I had a friend build the frame. Oh, wonderful. Um, Karen LeBlanc wants to know, how did you sew the pieces together? Did you use like a sewing machine or did you, hand? I think you just mm -hmm. said that you hand stitch. Are you a sewing machine? Yeah, sewing machine. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. All right. And then the she asked about the frame, but you already answered that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, somebody was asking about a place called Resourceful in Santa Fe. This is also from Pamela. She said, sometimes you get wonderful odd yards there. Are you familiar with that place? No, but uh -oh, thank it you. Sounds like a gold mine. <laughs> <laughs> thank and, you, and Pamela. <laughs> thank you. My pocketbook does not thank you, but thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard of a couple of places where they just bring in, you know, people bring in yarns and they resell them or redistribute them. Um, same thing. I think I would lose my mind if I went into a place like that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I was looking at some of these yarns when I, the first year I started weaving, my ex-boyfriend's family gifted me two giant boxes full of, let's see, this was my ex-boyfriend's aunt who lived here in New Mexico in the 1970s. She had a ranch. She was a famous weaver here. I've actually found a couple of her pieces in uh, thrift stores. And she tended to all of her animals and spun the yarns. It was, I lost my marbles. I was like, this is better than diamonds. Somebody was asking, are you represented by a gallery in um, New Mexico? Or Not at the moment. Okay. okay. I am looking, I, I do, I really want to find the right gallery, um, San Francisco, LA, New York, or possibly in Spain. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So most of your, um, your work is seen on your website, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's, right. that's definitely where I do 90% of my business, but it, you know, in the past I have worked with galleries. All right. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for being on here today. I really do appreciate it. and everything that you shared with us. I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all. And if you didn't recognize her name, um, Rihanna was also an invited artist at Convergence and you can see her work there also. Um, I would encourage you to go to her website. It's amazing. You can see her beautiful work. Uh, it's RihannaGriago.com. Um, and um, you can see her work there. We appreciate um, her sponsor today. Again, it is a um, vacation with an artist. What a great name. 
And like I'd said before, it's uh, you do like an apprenticeship with a master artisan and they're all over the world. You know, there's people in Czechoslovakia and Italy and Spain and the Southwest U.S., um, and then you spend time with the artists and they work with you and um, you finish product or products, whatever you might be. And it's everything. It's not just fiber. It's clay. It's jewelry. Uh, I think they had a blacksmithy at one time. But the trick is to go to their website and keep uh, and sign up for their uh, newsletter. And then they send out, you know, who's next, who's a new artist they've signed up. And you can keep track and and look for that. Maybe there's a particular art form that you want to try. Um, if you want to be a sponsor of Textiles and Tea, please go to our website, weavespendie.org. Uh, whether it's your business, your guild, a group of people uh, want to sponsor an episode, please go to our website or give me a call and we'll figure out what date works best for you. We are in the middle of spinning and weaving week and it goes through Sunday. We have all kinds of amazing things coming on. We did a um, tour yesterday that was wonderful. It's Lori Carlson Steger. We've got more tours coming up. We've got thread talks. We've got um, marketing, um, Marketplace Live. We've had vendors showing us some great new products. It's that time of year when you're getting ready to make things for the holidays. Um, and we also have the fashion show. We need you all to sign up for that. Now, I know you got things done after Convergence. We want to see what y'all are making. And it's not just the fashion show. It's if you're, you've are you got those great dish towels, I want to see them. Uh, I want to see you guys do like Susie Ballinger did a few years ago. And she had this great beach towel and her whole family uh, showed it off for us. It was so much fun. Come join us. We want to see what you're working on. What is new on your loom? And uh, show us what you've got. And again, it doesn't have to be clothing. It can be anything that's handmade. Um, you, you can sign up and, oh, and don't forget it's for 90 days. Everything's recorded. So even if you sign up now, you're going to see everything that was on yesterday and today. Um, and then you, cause we all work, right? Some of us work for a living. So you can go back later and watch the things over and over again. Um, you can see everything that you missed. Um, and it's for 90 days and it's only $30 for members. That's a lot of viewing for $30. So check it out. Go to our website, weavespendie.org, and you can sign up there. We want to thank everyone who supported HGA through their membership and through donations. As always, donations are what keeps our programming going, whether it's Spitting and Weaving Week, Textiles and Tea, Careers and Textiles, all the programming we do throughout the year is supported by the donations that you give to the Hand Weavers Guild of America. We truly appreciate your donations. If you want to donate or join, again, go to weavespindie.org. If you missed any episodes, you can go back and watch them again. People are always asking us if we can do that. You can either watch it on Facebook. You can go to the HGA Facebook page. You don't have to have a membership to Facebook. They tell you that you do, but you don't. Or you can watch it on YouTube. And I would encourage you, if you want to watch it on YouTube, it's to subscribe to the HGA YouTube channel. That way, when a new one is uploaded, you'll get a notice and you can see it. Next week, we have Vandana Jain. Um, I'm excited to talk with this artist. And I hope you all will join us. Hope you have a great week. We will see you next Tuesday. Hope I see you later on this week on uh, Spinning and Weaving Week. Thank you so much and happy tea.